Hi, this is Sue Jackson of the Live with MECFS blog, and I'm here today to talk to you about mainly about using a heart rate monitor, um, but also a step counter. Most of the talk will be about the the heart rate monitor, but we'll we'll pull the step counter in at the end. Um, but both of these as tools to help you quantify your limits and stay within them to prevent post-exertional crashes. So, as anyone with MECFS knows, the worst part of this disease is that even mild exertion can be too much for us and cause a crash or a, a worsening. Officially, this is known as post-exertional malaise or PEM. Um, I think most of us feel that malaise really doesn't describe the agony of how you feel the next day after doing too much. But um, that's the official term, at least according to the CDC. Um, another term that is often used is exercise intolerance or exertion intolerance, but they all mean the same thing. Even a mild amount of exertion can be too much for us and can make us, all of our symptoms worsen. Um, if you've been having a good day and you do too much, the next day you feel like you've suddenly got the flu. It, it's that sudden and that, um, that big a shift. For most of us, we just call it a crash. Okay, so what exactly is post-exertional malaise? And where does it come from? There was a study done recently of more than 1,500 adults with MECFS. And uh, let me see if I get this right. 78% of them said that post-exertional malaise occurred as a result of the basic activities of living. So while it's sometimes called exercise intolerance, you know, just standing up to walk to the bathroom or cooking a meal can be too much for us. And, and of course that makes it almost impossible to avoid. So that's where the heart rate monitor comes in. Um, I should have worn long sleeves today. <laughs> so what's actually happening behind the scenes? Well, there are several mechanisms at work here. Um, and I'll, I, I'm not a medical doctor myself, so I'm gonna keep this simple. Um, put it in the terms that I understand. So within our cells, we have mitochondria, which you may have heard of. These are like tiny little engines. The mitochondria convert food and fuel and vitamins and all that good stuff into energy. Um, they're these tiny little engines inside our cells. With MECFS, the mitochondria aren't working properly. And as a result, um, we don't, our cells don't use oxygen the way they should. So let's start with some definitions. For most people, if they, most healthy people, if they're exercising, the cells are using oxygen to convert to energy, and that's called aerobic exercise. I'm sure you've heard of that before. Um, aerobic simply means uses oxygen. So if somebody has been exercising, again, a healthy person, has been exercising for a long time or at a very high intensity, um, eventually their cells will run out of oxygen to use and will switch over to anaerobic metabolism um, or anaerobic exercise. Anaerobic means without oxygen. However, in people with MECFS, um, we do that conversion from aerobic to anaerobic very, very quickly and at a very low intensity of exertion. So um, that point where your cells switch from aerobic uh, metabolism to anaerobic metabolism is called the anaerobic threshold or AT for short. So just keep in mind that AT means where your oxid, where your cells stop using oxygen for energy 
and switch to an anaerobic um, approach. Which, so think about, um, again, a healthy person, think about a really well-trained athlete. Um, they normally are in aerobic mode. However, if they say run a marathon, an elite athlete runs a marathon, toward the end of that marathon, it's anaerobic. And so they might feel it the next day. Well, the same thing is happening with us, only we go into anaerobic from just standing up or walking around the house or cooking a simple meal. So this is part of where our crashes come from, um, that our anaerobic threshold is so very low. Our cells aren't using oxygen properly, so they're very quickly converting to this anaerobic method, which causes a crash. During anaerobic metabolism, there's a buildup of lactic acid. Um, I'll make sure I get all these lactate, carbon dioxide. All of these things accumulate in the cells and endurance is reduced. So again, for an elite athlete, that happens after a long and intense workout. For us, it can happen just from walking around in our own homes. So that's part of the story is the low, um, the low anaerobic threshold. The other part of the story is orthostatic intolerance or OI. I've got a whole other hour long video about OI. So I will include the link to that down below. Um, to simplify, OI simply means we have difficulty maintaining a stable heart rate and or blood pressure, particularly when we're upright. So you may have seen this, even if you've never heard of OI, um, over 97% of people with ME-CFS have some form of OI. And many people with fibro, with Lyme disease, um, with MS, with other conditions as well, also have OI. You may have heard of POTS, which is one type of OI. So with all OI, you can't, you can't hold your blood pressure and or heart rate steady. So what happens with us is we stand up and for most people with ME-CFS, the heart rate goes way up and the blood pressure goes down. And that combination, either of those alone or the combination of the two of them, makes us feel very sick. Now you may actually even feel dizzy or faint but those aren't necessary for OI. Very often in ME-CFS, we just feel worse when we're upright. Um, standing, but even just sitting up like I am now, um, I certainly feel better when I'm lying down and that's an indication of OI. So again, there's a lot more information on OI in my other video or on my blog post and I'll link both down below. Um, but for a moment, just keep that in mind. So for post-exertional malaise or these post-exertional crashes that we keep having, you've got at least two factors going on. You've got this um, lack of oxygen in the cells, which by the way is called oxidative stress, which gives us a very low anaerobic threshold our bodies, our cells switch from aerobic to anaerobic metabolism very quickly. And at the same time, so our anaerobic threshold is low. At the same time, we've got higher than normal heart rates. So it takes very little. That anaerobic threshold is our, think of that as your limit, as um, when you've done too much and might crash. And if our heart rate's too high and our anaerobic threshold is too low, it means we're almost constantly over our AT, which means we're almost constantly crashing. And I'll tell you more about my own experiences with that in a moment. So the best way to figure out what your own AT is, um, well, the gold standard is a two-day exercise test. Um, it's called CPET. Um, it was developed specifically for ME-CFS um, to take into account 
those crashes that we have and how if we exercise on the first day, our stamina and endurance will be greatly reduced on the second day. So that's what that test can show. But it's a two-day exercise test in a specialized facility. So most of us can't do that. The second best alternative is simply to es estimate your anaerobic threshold or AT with a simple formula. So for healthy people, AT is estimated simply by 220 minus your age. That's how most people estimate their AT. That's what a fitness tracker will do automatically. You put your age in and it, it tells you that's your, your anaerobic threshold. Um, for us with MECFS, again, our AT is much lower than in healthy people. So for us, the formula would be 220 minus your age and then multiply that by 0.6 or 60% of what a healthy person's AT would be. That gives you a rough estimate. Now, if you're severely ill, um, you should probably use 50% or 0.5 as that multiplying factor. Um, there are additional details. I wrote a whole article about this for the ProHealth website, and I'll include that link down below as well, because it's got additional details on, on calculating um, AT for us. But this is a good starting point. Um, and you really don't need anything more than that as a starting point. Estimate your AT with 220 minus your age times 0.6. That gives you an idea of what it is. So for me now in my 50s, um, calculated like that, my AT is 100. Um, it might be a little lower than that now, the calculation. Um, but I'm going to stick with that because it's an easy number to work with as an example. Now, in reality, my AT is actually higher than that, and I'll talk about that in a little while because that's as a result of using a heart rate monitor and treating OI and, and some other things I've done. So you can increase your AT over time, and I'll talk about that later. But for now, let's just use as an assumption that my AT in my 50s is 100. So what that means is I can use a heart rate monitor and set the upper limit to 100 with an audible alarm. And then if I'm wearing the heart rate monitor, anytime I go over my limit, it will beep at me. So um, I should have put it on upside down so that you could see it better. But as you can see, it's about 90 right now. Um, and that's just sitting up. Um, that's also with beta blockers in my system. That's the treatment I use for orthostatic intolerance. It brings my heart rate down by about 30 beats per minute. And more on that in a moment too. Let's just start with the measuring. So you've got an estimate of your AT. Now you need a heart rate monitor. Um, again, the articles that I'll link below include lots of tips on finding one. What I'm wearing right now is unfortunately no longer available. I don't know if the company went out of business or just quit making them. I love this thing. It's a Mio Alpha. Um, you can sometimes find them um, like on Amazon from being sold by other sellers, you know, people who still have some in stock. Um, I've, I've really liked it. I got my, well, I got my first heart rate monitor in 2011 I was surprised to see that today. Um, and then my first two were the kind with a chest strap. Um, most of those are made by Polar. There may be other brands making them as well. The problem I had with the chest strap was just, it was uncomfortable. It was inconvenient. Um, now I imagine this is a much bigger problem for women than it is for men, but I could not easily put it on in public. Um, the newer ones had, um, you had to put gel, contact gel on the back to make it work right. It was just, and with all that trouble, it actually wasn't working that well for me. Um, and again, it may be because I'm not 
a man with a flat chest. But, um, you know, it just, it would cut out at times. It just wasn't working well for me. So the Mio Alpha was one of the first of the heart rate monitors that came without a chest strap. Um, there are lots of these available now, of course, and we, we mostly call them fitness trackers. So Fitbit makes lots of them. Um, I got one for my son that was uh, Garmin uh, Vivio Smart 4, I think is what it's called. Again, all the details are in my blog post and my article below. Um, what you want, here are the features you want to look for. You want a big readout that you can easily see and a constant heart rate readout. So if it's a fitness tracker, it may have a bunch of different functions, but you want to be able to set it at heart rate and have it stay there with a visible readout so you can just glance down anytime and see what your heart rate is. Um, you also, as I said, want to be able to set an audible alarm for your own personal AT. So you don't want, um, the cheaper ones may come pre-programmed to um, calculate your AT based on that formula for healthy people, which doesn't work for us. So you want to make sure that, um, that the one you buy allows you to set a custom upper limit. Um, before I bought my son the Garmin, I, I actually called Garmin Tech Support and asked them that question, and they explained to me how to do it. So um, it's just something to look for. Um, those are really the two biggest things you want, as well as just being comfortable so that you'll wear it. Now, when I did a little informal poll recently in some of my online groups um, of people with MECFS, most people said what they're really loving now are smartwatches. Now, I have a brand new Apple Watch my husband gave me for Christmas. And as you can see, I haven't even turned it on yet. Um, I got COVID right after Christmas, so my energy level has been really low. But this is high on my list. I'm going to figure out how to use it and get it started because almost everyone I talked to said their favorite way to track heart rate was with a smartwatch, like an Apple Watch or um, Galaxy makes their own now too. So um, those are your different options. So find a heart rate monitor that you like, figure out how to set that upper limit um, with an audible alarm for your own personal AT. And then you can kind of test it out to see whether your AT estimate is accurate for you. So the more severe your disease, likely the lower your AT is. Um, and that's why, you know, the, the calculation is just an estimate and you want to test it out a bit. So start wearing your heart rate monitor. Wear it all the time for the first few days at least or the first week because you want to get a baseline of how much exertion you can tolerate without crashing the next day and how much is too much for you. So start with that limit that you calculated. If you stay below that for a couple of days and um, you're still crashing, then it's too high. Play around with it a little bit, lower it by five beats per minute, try it again, see if that prevents a crash. On the other hand, if you find you can go over your limit by a certain amount and not crash the next day, then your AT may be a little bit higher. Um, so you can adjust when, as you get experience. So for me personally, when I first put on that first heart rate monitor, it was a tremendous learning experience. Um, I had no idea that almost everything I did all day long had me over my limits. My plan when I got my first heart rate monitor in 2011 was to use it when I was doing more exerting things like taking a walk or going to the grocery store. So the first day I strapped it on, I was gonna take a walk. I got it on, got it started, set the alarm. I stood up 
and it was already over my limit. <laughs> um, at the time, I think my limit was about 105 and just standing up, you know, pushed it to like 108 or something. And so I walked over to the door and I bent down to put my sneakers on and it started beeping at me and I looked at it and my heart rate was up to 115. <laughs> my limit was 105 and I hadn't even left the house yet. So I did manage a very slow, very short walk that day. It took me about 15 minutes to just do a really short loop around um, our cul-de-sac. I was going really slowly, but my heart rate was still over my limit much of the time. So that was a real learning experience for me. Um, and especially that putting my shoes on made my heart rate go higher than actually walking. So um, from then on, I decided to wear it for a week or so. And um, it was, it was eye opening. So what I learned was that almost everything I did put me over my limit. Um, my resting heart rate, like if I was on the couch with my feet up, might be in the nineties and standing up, you know, stand up to go to the bathroom or get a cup of tea and it would easily go over my limit of 105. Um, and actually doing something really exerting, you know, like carrying a load of laundry, taking a walk, you know, and it shot way up. Um, I found that certain, it surprised me what was over my limits and what wasn't. So I could go grocery shopping and I could manage pushing the cart, walking around the store, checking out. The part that put my heart rate over the limits was carrying the groceries inside in the house when I got home. Um, and that was my first time learning that lifting and carrying things raises my heart rate quite a bit. Anything that uses your arms, you put your arms up over your head. Okay, yeah, it, and it goes up. So um, that was a learning experience. Um, I also found that doing a load of laundry could shoot it up to like 130. And I was like, you know, but again, I was using my arms, I was lifting. There was a lot going on there. Um, if you've ever experienced taking a shower and feeling horrible afterwards. Well, that's from OI. The hot water makes your OI even worse. So it raises your heart rate. Um, and I found, you know, if I put my heart rate monitor on right after my shower, it was at like 130. So that was my learning experience. Um, and I realized I could not live and stay within my limits. I mean, I couldn't I couldn't manage the daily functions of living. Just like that store, that study I mentioned at the beginning where 78% of the people said basic daily living functions made them crash. I learned the same thing, which was why I was in this constant state of crashing. You know, so many bad days. Um, and if I felt good one day, I was guaranteed to feel bad the next it was because my heart rate was almost always over my limits. So um, there are a couple of things you can do about that. Um, there was a, a, just a, a case study of one person, um, but it was done by the Workwell Foundation, which is like the number one exercise intolerance research organization in the world. Um, we're very lucky to have them focused on MECFS. And um, one of the doctors there studied a single, just one woman um, who they did the, the big two day exercise test. So they had a very accurate AT for her. Um, and they gave her a heart rate monitor and she was instructed to stay below her AT. Um, at the same time, they started a program for her of very light strength change strength training, like um, doing lying down because your heart rate's lower when you're lying down, wearing her heart rate monitor and staying below her limits, 
But, you know, just starting with some leg lifts, some arm lifts, um, a little core strengthening, just some very simple, very light exercises while lying down. And importantly, this is not GET because she was wearing her heart rate monitor and she was instructed not to go over her limits. So she started on this program of wearing her heart rate monitor, staying below her limits, and three times a week doing this very, very light strength training while lying down. And over the course of one year, her improvements were pretty stunning. They redid the, the uh, CPET test and they found out she had a 75% improvement in the time it took her to recover from exercise. So, so when she had done the test the first time a year earlier, two-day exercise test, guaranteed to crash us, right? Um, it took her a full month to recover. When she redid the test a year later, it took her a week to recover. So that's a 75% improvement. Um, at the same time, they discovered with the test that her AT had increased by 20 beats per minute. That means that simply staying within her limits and doing a little bit of light work within her limits to strengthen her muscles actually increased her limits significantly. 20 beats per minute is a lot. Um, so I found that study really fascinating. For myself, you know, when I saw that simply getting up off the couch made me hit my limits, um, I decided to, uh, at that point, look into treating orthostatic intolerance. It was really the heart rate monitor that let me see how significant a factor that was for me, how high my heart rate really was. Um, so I have two sons that at the time both had ME-CFS. One has recovered. Um, they were both being treated for orthostatic intolerance, but I never took that extra step to treat myself. That's kind of how it is when you have kids. Um, you know, they, they came first and they needed to go to school and be able to play with their friends, you know. So I had seen the effects it had on them, but finally the heart rate monitor clued me in to how much this could help me treating orthostatic intolerance. So for me, my doctor and I decided there are dozens and dozens and dozens of different options for treating OI. And again, it's all covered in my video or blog post um, that I've linked below. Lots of different options for treating OI. What we decided on for me was a beta blocker. Um, I was very lucky that the first one I tried worked really well for me. That is very seldom the case. Um, so trial and error and patience and persistence are very important when treating OI. But for me, um, I found a low dose beta blocker that worked very well for me. My husband and I went to the drugstore to pick it up that first day. I don't know, we were out running errands or something. I took the first pill right in the car and, and I had my heart rate monitor on and within an hour, my heart rate had dropped by 30 beats per minute, which was just stunning to me. So treating OI brought my heart rate down far enough that I could at least manage the basic daily functions of living. Um, I was now able, well, to get up off the couch for starters, um, but to cook a simple dinner, to go to the grocery store, to take short walks without going over my AT. This was absolutely life-changing for me. And the ultimate effect was far fewer crash days and way more good days. So um, I highly recommend looking into diagnosing and treating orthostatic intolerance. But even without that, as I described in that case study, simply monitoring your heart rate 
and staying below your AT can also have a significant impact on your life if you're able to do that. And as with the woman in that case study, I found that the benefits um, increased over time. So when I started the beta blocker for OI, I didn't actually feel better. I knew it was working because I could see my heart rate had dropped by 30 beats per minute. Um, but I didn't feel any different. However, it allowed me to do more without going over my limits. And those constant post-exertional crashes eventually long-term worsen our condition. So when you leave these things untreated, you get worse over time. Um, and treating them has the opposite effect. I was very pleased to find that over the next several years, although I didn't feel better immediately, I did over time because I was able to do more. I was crashing less. Um, I was able finally to walk a little bit, to begin some light strength training exercises. And as with the woman in the case study, I do a lot of that lying on the floor um, to keep my heart rate down. And then as my fitness level improved and my muscle tone improved, that further improved OI. And I did eventually feel better from all this. So avoiding crashes is really important. And the heart rate monitor can help you do that. So um, very briefly, I want to cover one other tool that I only recently discovered, and that is counting steps. It's another way to quantify your limits and to know when you're doing too much. Um, now I had all these plans for showing you exactly what I've been doing. And then as I was setting this up, I realized I use my phone, which is my step counter, to record this video. So I can't show you that. I will um, insert some graphs here from my phone. So, okay, don't laugh, but I'm new to smartphones. I only got my first smartphone two years ago, a little less than two years ago, in summer 2020, when my old phone finally gave up. Um, and I'm still learning what all the features are. So I had read an article about some of the health features on an iPhone, which is what I have. And I had no idea there was a step counter in my phone. <laughs> so normally, particularly around the house, I don't carry my phone with me. I leave it sitting on the counter. But um, I began carrying my, this is just a few months ago, I began carrying my phone in my pocket with me all day long and um, and looking at the step count at the end of the day. And I learned some really interesting things. Just like the heart rate monitor, it offers a quantifiable way to measure my limits. I'll show you a weekly graph. Now take a look at what I discovered was any day I got close to or exceeded 4,000 steps was too much for me. I would crash the next day. So take a look at one of my weekly graphs. And I just used this um, at the beginning in hindsight, you know, to say, how many steps did I do today? How do I feel? And then the next day, did I crash or didn't I? Um, and it gave me this idea. So I think normally um, I have a higher limit with the steps. But um, as I mentioned, I did get COVID in January. It worsened my ME-CFS, including everything. Um, my stamina and the post-exertional malaise, post-exertional crashes have been much worse than usual for me. So this is my current limit. I can see that 4,000 steps a day is too much for me. On an average day, I'm doing between 2,000 to 2,500. Um, if I'm badly crashed and I'm on the couch all day, it's more like 1,000 to 1,500. We, we have kind of a big house and a lot of stairs. So even if I don't leave the house, there's a, there's a fair number of steps there. 
but um, this gave me another way to measure my limits and when I'm going past them. So just briefly, I'll show you one of my monthly charts. So you can see there the ups and the downs. Um, I can compare that to the calendar where I track how I feel and see where the crashes are. Um, and it was really enlightening to me to look back at the one year data because even though you, you can see the big jump um, a few months ago when I started carrying my phone all the time, but even before that, you know, if I was out of the house, I had my phone either in my pocket or in my purse. I guess it counts the steps either way. Um, and you can see in my graph of the past year, you can very clearly see that I was doing well in May. I got my two COVID vaccines, which knocked me out for a while. Um, you can see I went down a number of steps and just gradually came back up. Um, you can see that I was doing quite well by the end of last year. And then you can very clearly see January when I had COVID and I was pretty much bedridden for three weeks. Um, you know, there's hardly any steps there. And then the last three months as I've been carrying the phone with me and counting all of my steps. So I'll show you that. So what you can see from that is, um, I don't know, I love data. So this just shows, it not only shows what I experienced last year and the actual effects that the COVID vaccine had on me, which I didn't fully understand at the time. But it also shows since I had COVID in January, I have felt really stuck and plateaued, but I can see that each month since then, I've been able to do a few more steps. Now, I'm not trying to do more steps. It's just an indication that I'm able to be a little more active without crashing. Um, so that's how I'm using my step counter. So the two things, the heart rate monitor and the step counter, are simply tools that you can use to quantify your limits, to know when you're doing too much, and to see what makes you crash and then avoid that. Um, and the effects of that are profound. If you can avoid crashes and, you know, as, as you saw in that case study I described, you will, even without any treatment, eventually see some improvement if you're staying below your limits and avoiding crashes. Now, if you go ahead and try some treatments as well as I have, you may see even greater effects. But, um, you know, the idea with the heart rate monitor and step counter is simply to give you some data, some hard data on what you're doing and how much is too much, which I have found tremendously helpful. And I hope you do too.